With that, let's do something radical. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity that you've provided. We pray that your purpose would be accomplished in every life here among us, every life that's here present and those that are watching this video or hearing this tape. We just pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished, that each of us might be blessed by what you bring for us, that you might help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and that we each might become more fruitful stewards of the opportunities you've provided. As we commit ourselves and this evening into your hands, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've crossed the halfway point in our 12-session um, exploration of the book of Genesis. We've budgeted the first half of the available time to the first 11 chapters. We've got one or two coming over here but with the creation week. But now we're moving into the post-flood world. We've, we've been through Noah and the reason for the flood and the, the actual experience of the flood up until uh, up through Genesis 9. Session 13 will focus on what I'll call the post-flood world, chapters 9 and 10. And uh, now Genesis, uh, we've been through, obviously, the, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are regarded widely as a separate section. Some people call it prehistory, uh, from the flood of Noah, the post-flood world, and then the Tower of Babel uh, is in, in, in the next session. That will set us up for what you might call the main part of the book of Genesis, the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And uh, so, having been through the flood of Noah, we're now going to explore the post-flood world. Now, we, when we study Genesis, we recognize the creation was incremental steps of introducing order into chaos, or reducing entropy. And each of the six days was major steps in inserting information, inserting design into the universe. So that when you get to the seventh uh, uh, day, there was no more of that. God rested. And there is no Erev and Boker, no more stepping, uh, uh, steps of uh, uh, it, uh, reducing entropy. Until we get to the fall of man, and then suddenly, because of the fall of man and the, the introduction of the curse, the order in the universe declines drastically, or entropy, as mathematicians say, entropy increases. There's a second occasion when that entropy also is, is uh, increased, and that's the changes that occur at the flood. I want to emphasize this because it's not just, the flood was not just a lot of water. The planet Earth substantially changed. In fact, all of history as we know it is post-flood. It's certainly post-curse. None of us have any idea what the creation was like prior to Genesis 3, because everything we know is since God cursed instituted the curse. That's also true to a substantial measure since the flood. We have hints of all kinds of the existence of the flood. We also have evidences of all kinds that the earth before the flood was quite different in many ways. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. The thermal blanket that many scientists believe protected the earth from radiation um, is gone. You can have a water canopy without, and still have it transparent. A lot of people figure, gee, you know, was it overcast all the time? No. Even on a clear blue sky, any pilot will tell you there can be a lot of water vapor. The water vapor is a whole other issue. Um, it was the end of a universal climate. They find uh, these huge mammoths in Alaska and Siberia that have tropical vegetation in their stomachs, suddenly frozen. It required degrees, virtually a couple of hundred degrees below Fahrenheit, to instantaneously quick freeze them that fast so that the leaves in their mouths still have the imprint of the motors. That's, that's a, a live animal frozen that quickly implies a huge catastrophic change. But the end of a universal climate. Why is there coal in Antarctica? See, it implies tropical vegetation uh, in ancient times. The other thing that many people are not aware of, that, that, that there's evidence that atmospheric pressure prior to the flood was probably two to one higher. And I'm told by, from a number of sources that hyperbaric medicine is a whole frontier. They're discovering that higher pressure oxygen can kill diseases. There's speculation by many scientists that that alone may have accounted for much of the extended longevities that we experienced prior to the flood. 
But after the flood, among other things, the atmospheric pressure apparently reduces to the one that we're all familiar with. Pterodactyls are said not to be able to fly if, unless the, the atmospheric pressure was two to one higher or better. And that, of course, the extended longevities, longevities uh, are another part of the mystery, partly due to the radiation and who knows. But let's jump in then to chapter 9, which is going to be our experience with a post-flood world. And uh, we're going to discover there's a whole new order of things. Noah and his descendants are not vegetarians anymore. They're encouraged to eat meat. Capital punishment is ordained along with the institution of human government, we'll see. And uh, those things are linked together, obviously. Sinful man's been wiped out from the flood, but not sin. And we're going to discover one of the first acts in the first family or, uh, it was the emergence of sin. And uh, Noah, out of all this, Noah will give us a prophecy that we'll talk about that sets the stage for chapter 10. So let's just jump in. Chapter 9, verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This it may not be obvious until you think about it, but this is underscoring God's first institution, that of marriage for procreation. God is encouraging them to be fruitful and multiply. And the context, of course, presumes in, with, you know, from the point of view of a marriage union in terms of mankind and to replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Now there are some people that conjecture from this verse that the dinosaurs were casualties in the flood. They may or may not have been. People say, well, how'd you get a dinosaur aboard a, 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 an ark? Well, I imagine you get the small ones, you know, the, 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 the newly born ones, but whatever. But there are some scientists who feel that they were a casualty. People, all these, all these articles you find that are trying to explain what, what made the dinosaurs disappear. Was it this meteorite that hit Mexico? And they have all these conjectures. Hey, there's a much simpler one. Look around the entire planet Earth for evidence, and you'll find it everywhere, of a universal flood. And that could, could have been part of it. And, and the reason they build it on this verse, some of them do, is because this implies that all animals on the Earth are going to have the dread of mankind. And, uh, and for good reason. And uh, so, uh, so you, th that's a conjecture. You can take it if you like it, whatever. Continuing in verse 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now that's a broad generality. You realize, of course, that in the Bible, very often, they'll have a general statement. It doesn't imply it's not without some exceptions. That doesn't mean there aren't some things that live that you really don't want to eat just as there are some plants that you really don't want to eat, even though they were generally, apparently, vegetarians beforehand, and now uh, they're uh, being, uh, you would say that mankind goes from being an herbivore to, a car to an omnivore, not just a carnivore. And uh, so, um, and uh, we got in a discussion in one of the breaks, one of the earlier sessions, about this exclusive all. I'll give you an example. It's probably one of the easiest to understand. In Revelation chapter 5, John says, I sat, I, I, I watched, and I, he that sat on the throne had a, 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 a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with the seven seals. And the word came out, who is, what, who, what man is there, it's worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof. And then John says, I sobbed convulsively because no man was found that was uh, worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now that's the generality. He's crying about it. But then an elder says, weep, what, weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And John says, I looked and behold, expect to see a root of David. I saw the lamb as it had been slain. But the point is, the generality that no one, no, it had to be a man, it had to be kinsman of Adam. No man was found. And there's a pause as John realizes that you and I may miss that unless we really understood the passage. But John understands what that means. And he sobbed convulsively is what the Greek actually says. I wept much. Then else says, wait, wait, wait. There's an exception. Praise God. Jesus Christ. But I, I mention that rhetorically. Often in the Bible you'll find a generality, and then later, a verse or two later, or sometimes a chapter later, there'll be an exception here and there. And uh, there's a, you know, the, the, there'll be some rival to the throne that killed all the children that were heir to the throne. And then you find out, but a servant hid one of the babies, you know, and so on. So you'll find, as just a rhetorical style, the generality that's expressed doesn't mean it's not without some exception that will be explained. You follow me? So this doesn't mean you can eat anything, right? 
But flesh with the life thereof, which is, in, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. So the, 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 the uh, digestion of blood is prohibited. And I want you to notice for everyone, not just the Jews. This gets emphasized in the Torah. This gets emphasized in Leviticus. But you may recall in Acts 15, when Paul and Peter are up before the Council of Jerusalem trying to communicate what's going on in the Gentile world. The Gentiles are coming to the Lord. And, what do we, and it, was, it, was understandable, uh, it was an understandable presumption on the part of uh, most of the Jewish Christians that the way you, be, see, the way you, be, you came to the Lord in the, in the Old Testament is you proselyted to Judaism. And they assume that now they, know, they have the Messiah, Jesus, that the way you follow the Messiah is to become a Jew, a proselyte, and then accept Christ. And they're saying, no, no, you don't have to become a Jew to accept Christ. He's, he's, and and that, that was Paul and Peter both. That was what was going on. They had a big council of Jerusalem to unravel this thing because the, Judah, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Jewish leadership uh, couldn't handle that for a while until they had a meeting. And James, the brother of the Lord who's chairing the proceedings, quoting from Amos 9, points out that, uh, that this, was, this was prophesied. This is, and, that, and well, what do we require? Do we require them to keep the law? Of course not. And if you, you want to understand uh, Acts uh, 15, um, there really are two problems in that chapter, by the way, not just the question, does a Gentile have to become a Jew? The second problem that goes unspoken, but it's implied, if a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew, what's to become of the Jew? See, the other problem is if that's all done away with, what are we doing? And James points out, not only does a Gentile not have to become a Jew, but after this, he's going to... Uh, 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 deal with Israel. Israel. God is not through with Israel. And James brings that out there. And of course, uh, uh, Paul writes three chapters of the book of Romans on that subject. But what I'm getting at is this prohibition of blood isn't just a Jewish thing. It clearly is a Jewish thing, but it's also emphasized for Gentiles in Acts 15. And it's also ordained here in the days of Noah, long before Abraham and so on. So that's a key point to understand. And the other thing that's implied here, and it's going to be elaborated on, capital punishment is required. Boy, you find more debates about capital punishment. And due to the corruption of our judicial system, I think many of us have a leaning away from capital punishment because we don't trust the, the judicial process to provide a fair, a, a fair verdict. But biblically, God equates human government with the right of capital punishment. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, and by the way, the language here implies that it's premeditatively, not accidental. We're not talking about what you and I call manslaughter. We're talking about premeditated murder here. In the, in the, it, it's a purposeful shedding is what's talked about here. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So this is heavy stuff. Many people have strong feelings about capital punishment. Biblically, though, God... Uh, uh, holds man accountable for his, your spirits. It's interesting as you study these issues to realize in ancient Israel there was something missing. You know what they didn't have in ancient Israel? Prisons. They didn't have any prisons. They didn't have a police force either, by the way. It was a family next of kin that had the responsibility to avenge the blood of uh, a kinsman. Anyway, I'm not suggesting you go back to that. I'm just giving some background. Um, <clears throat> and you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. Pretty straightforward stuff. Lex talionis, we talked about that in the book of Leviticus, so, uh, eye for an eye, life for life, blood for blood. That was the concept. And uh, so this uh, law for capital punishment on murderers, and bear in mind I'm, I'm not talking about... Uh, uh, accidental deaths. That's handled a different way. That's what the cities of refuge were instituted for and so on. And uh, so, and the execution of the law was uh, not retained by God. He gave it to man to follow through on. And uh, so it wasn't, wait, they didn't expect a miraculous administration that someone guilty of murder, he would somehow, God would bring him down. No, no, that was man's responsibility. So what's passing here by God to mankind, admittedly there's, you know, four families. 
Noah and his three sons and their four wives. They are, God is handing them the responsibility to govern themselves. So when there's murder, it was the, up to them to administer justice, but justice here was capital punishment. And uh, there's a very interesting inversion of this, by the way. Um, in about uh, 7 AD, Caponius was appointed uh, procurator in Judea, and uh, one of the things that they, he did was to take away from the Sanhedrin the right for, of capital punishment. And at that time, the priests went around the city of Jerusalem in sackcloth and ashes because they really believed that the law of God had been broken. Because in Genesis 49.10, there's a prophecy that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh, the Messiah, comes. And when the scepter departed from Judah, which is the way they interpreted the, the loss of capital punishment, they actually thought that the, law, that, the, that the word of God had been broken. And so they be, literally went in sackcloth and around Jerusalem bemoaning the fact, not knowing that up in Nazareth there was a young boy in a carpenter shop. And so, very interesting. It's all, you find that in Josephus and the Babylonian Talmud and what have you. Let's move on. Verse 8, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, I like that phrase. How straightforward. God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. This is an important passage. God is entering into a covenant with all mankind. This is not a Jewish thing. This is not a, you know, a law of Moses thing. This is a, a, a covenant with the Gentiles, because that's all there were at this point. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and for every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. And uh, I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. He's alluding to a rainbow. The term is bow and we think of it as a rainbow and that's what the word means. Um, the, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, it's interesting. Well, like, like, it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Pretty familiar ground but let's talk about a few things here. First of all, it's, uh, Dr. Barry Setterfield who has, was one of the earliest to identify the speed of light has been slowing down the speed of light was much higher, 100,000 times higher, even in the days of Solomon, many times higher in the creation period. His calculations suggest that it's possible, not certain, but it's possible that the speed of light had to slow down to a certain level before it would refract to create a rainbow and through a raindrop. And so it could be that the reason there weren't rainbows beforehand was because the speed of light hadn't slowed down enough to create a rainbow. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting the rainbow is strictly a natural occurrence. God is here designating it as a reminder that he's made a promise that the, the, the world, he'll never again destroy all flesh by a flood. Now, there's another implication more important than that one, and that is this. There are those that like to argue that the flood was a local phenomenon just in that region. And, a, and it's amazing how many very prominent Christian authors and, and speakers have that view in their heart of hearts. And I don't understand that view. I can understand lots of other controversies. There's good, good men have a right to differ, differ on a lot of subjects, but this one surprises me because God is saying that that rainbow and that covenant, he's promising never to do that again. Well, there's been lots of very substantial floods on the planet Earth. And if that flood was a local flood, he didn't keep his promises. You follow me? So strangely enough, if you hold the view that it was a local flood, you're indicting the character of God because God is clearly representing that whatever that was that happened is he's never going to do again do you trust him does God mean what he say and say, uh, says and does he say what he means I think so 
So it's not a question of just, uh, you know, uh, ge uh, uh, um, hydrology and geographics and stuff. It's really an issue on your attitude towards God. If you believe God says what he means and means what he says, then it was a universal flood. There's evidence for the universal flood too, but I'm not building my case on the evidence. I'm building my case on the, on the text. So, uh, and I'll remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living thing, uh, creature of all flesh, that water shall no more become a flood to destroy all the earth. Now, the other thing you need to learn about God is watch out for the small print. Because God very much means exactly what he says. And one of your tools as you get into prophecy especially is to be very precise. And uh, there are many times in the 40 years I've studied the Bible where I've had to revise my previously held views. But every time that I can recall, it's always been in the direction of taking even more literally than I did before. As I get closer to the text and, lo and look how it's fulfilled, I, there's some hair-curling examples. Um, uh, when, uh, when the Babylon conquered the southern kingdom, um, Jeremiah and Ezekiel had predictions about Zedekiah, what was going to happen. One said he'll never see Babylon, the other one said he's going to die there. And he made fun of them. You guys can't even get your own story together. And when the uh, Babylonians conquered him, they took Zedekiah, bound him with fetters of brass, put his sons before his eyes and slaughtered his sons before his eyes and then put out his eyes and carried him off to Babylon blinded. And he died there. You go back and read the prophecies, he would never see Babylon. Yet he died there. You think, ooh. I mean, you talk about precision. You, you see what I'm getting at? So you want to be careful. Well, in this case, too, is that, that God doesn't say he's not going to destroy the earth. And Peter explains that for us. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, through, uh, 5, 6, and 7, Peter in his second letter says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. That's what we've been reading about, right? But then he goes on to say, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by that same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Okay. God saying, I'm not going to destroy the earth next time by water, doesn't say he's not going to destroy it next time by fire. So you want to watch the small print, right? Let's move on to chapter 9, verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. You know, it's probably a very important, we may fail to really appreciate how terrifying uh, not only the animals probably were, because they don't know what's going on, but even mankind, as they leave the ark and go to settle, you'd think that every time they see a rain cloud, they'd get nervous. Can you imagine the insecurity of discovering the world having been wiped out? And so this assurance is probably far more essential than we have any idea uh, to, for them to just to continue to, 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 to have a, some kind of uh, optimism for the future. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Okay, so this is Genesis up to verse 17. But let me share another thought, sort of a peripheral thought. When we study the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the first horseman that comes out is riding a white horse, and because he is, many commentators get confused and presume that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it is, he's keeping bad company, because the other three horsemen are pretty grim characters. In fact, uh, it's our view and, uh, and the view of most conservative scholars that the first horseman is the Antichrist, for lots of reasons. And I won't get into a whole study of that, the whole other thing, but I will point out one thing that's kind of interesting. He carries with him not a sword, he carries with him a bow. And many people associate that bow with Nimrod for some good reasons, and we'll cover that in the next session. But the word bow talks on in the Greek is the same word there that is in the Septuagint here. And I believe that the Antichrist is going to come to power and his signature will be that he's going to enforce a covenant for seven years. Not sign a treaty, that's whatever he says. No, be careful. The language says he enforces a covenant. And the fact that he's carrying a bow in my mind, links with that because a bow is what? A token of a covenant. I think there's a clue there. 
I'm not suggesting he's carrying a rainbow. Don't misunderstand. Although maybe it is. I, you know, the, the, the New Agers have taken the rainbow as one of their symbols. So I, I'm not going there. My point is, though, he's carrying a bow, which is a, the word in the Greek is a token of a covenant. Because that's the way it's first used, first law first mentioned, remember, in, in, the, in here in Genesis 9. Not a big deal. Tuck it away in the back of your mind. As you study prophecy, keep that in mind. It's a possibility because the word toxin is used in both places. Let's move on. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. And uh, these are three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. In other words, all of us in this room are descendants of one or more of these three sons. I say more in the sense that they're, they're, they're you know, uh, uh, descendants cross-married too, so it's not that crisp. But anyway, uh, but the, Ham is the father of Canaan, which is a strange phrase. Because he's going to get into the genealogies, and he's going to mention that again. But Ham is the father of Canaan is mentioned twice as we go through these texts. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And by the way, not, not born in that order. Um, the... Um, uh, uh, the order in the Bible is often the most important first, not necessarily in chronological order. And Shem will be more important because out of him will come Abraham and so on. Ham is the father of Canaan, and that's probably emphasized for several reasons, some of which we'll come to. But if nothing else, is that the Canaanites were the proverbial adversaries of Israel. And so these genealogies are, are anticipatory of what you're going to need to know. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them were the whole earth overspread. Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Now, the word husbandman, actually, the term is a man of the ground, a farmer, is really what it is. And uh, Joshua in 5.4 is called a man of war. Second uh, Samuel 16.7 speaks of a man of blood, these terms. Genesis 46.32, uh, a man of cattle. Exodus 4.10, a man of words. That was Moses. These are terms. Well, he was a, he, he, Noah, apparently, knew how to farm. And it does not surprise, even though he's over 600 years old, he's farming. He's doing, he's setting a vineyard. Now, let's, we're going to talk about wine here a little bit, and so let's give, I like to have something to offend everyone. I don't want to play favorites. Uh, there's nothing wrong with wine. Fermentation is a natural process for, pre, uh, for, for, for uh, preservation. Deuteron Deuteronomy 25.4, 1 Corinthians 9.7 indicates that nothing wrong with wine. It's called beneficial in Judges 9, Psalm 104, Proverbs 31, 1 Timothy 5. So there's nothing wrong with wine. That doesn't mean it can't be abused. And that's what everybody is so concerned of. Wine is a symbol of blessings in Genesis 27. It's a, a, a symbol of blessing in Proverbs 9, Isaiah 25, Matthew 26. And uh, uh, it also was blessed by the Lord himself at Cana, at the, at the wedding in John chapter 2. So wine intrinsically, nothing wrong with it. In moderation, but drunkenness is the is the sin that's involved that we're getting into. Let's discern the difference between wine and an excess thereof. Drunkenness, of course, is condemned in more scriptures than you can list here, but I list a, uh, a dozen of them here, and that's that, that's so obvious it doesn't require, I think, further exposition. Well, so Noah raising a vine, you know, generating wine is not the problem. The problem was he drank of the wine and was drunken. Bad mistake, tragic mistake. And he was uncovered within his tent. Now this is strange. There's a strange passage here about which many good scholars have very differing views. But he was uncovered within his tent. Now literally it says it's reflexive. He uncovered himself within his tent. Whatever that turns out to mean. And Ham, and here it inserts a strange phrase, the father of Canaan. You see it says it a second time. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. So at least at a primitive level, what appears to be the problem here is that Ham looked upon the nakedness of his father, and that was considered an indignity to the family. And uh, it could, it, what could have happened here is that Ham may have uh, used this indignity as a attempt at leadership to discredit his father. Uh, he may have run out and told his brethren and tried to make a thing of it. They didn't buy into that. They wouldn't participate if that was all that was involved. But there are some views that have other things involved. The saw is nakedness. There are several views that float around here. 
There are rabbis that have the view that Ham actually castrated his father. And they justify the language, you know, that this is all a euphemism hiding that fact, and that's why Noah had no more, bo no more children after that. That's their argument. Well, I don't think it's too widely held, but I mention it as a possibility. Another view you'll find papers being written on in the seminaries and stuff is the view, this idea that he saw the nakedness, that phrase, you can find examples in the scripture where that phrase is talking about the nakedness of his wife. His wife's nakedness was Noah's nakedness is the concept. And they, some people suspect for some subtle reasons that Ham may have slept with what may have been a stepmother, not his actual mother, but he may have, the first mother died, could be a second marriage. See, some substantial time may have gone by. This wasn't the day after they got out of the ark. It could have been 20 years later. And so that Ham slept with a stepmother and that Canaan was the offspring. Some, rabbi, uh, some uh, scholars, it's all conjecture. I mentioning it's not that it's necessarily... Uh, bulletproof, just that you be aware that there are these strange views of what went on. A more widely held view by many scholars is that what's really being covered up here with euphemisms is that Ham was involved in a homosexual attack on his father. And that comes about, if nothing else, that Noah is going to discover when he wakes up he could tell something had been done to him. So that implies something more than a casual glance. And so uh, the word galah is the verb involved in Leviticus 18 from 6 to 19 in all but one verse that uses the causative form of this to indicate improper sexual behavior. But on the other hand, Noah had already uncovered himself, that's the reflexive form of Gala, in verse 21. So you've got arguments that you can take this both sides. Anyway, um, so Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And this is what opens the door for all these weird conjectures, because it wasn't just a glance, something apparently happened, whatever it was. But then what causes even further mystery, the fact that Ham may have uh, misbehaved in some way, he doesn't curse Ham, he curses his son. And this has caused volumes to be written by uh, commentators trying to figure out why is it, he said, cursed be Canaan. In other words, the son of Ham that's involved. That's why some scholars figure that maybe Canaan was an inappropriate offspring from Ham. So Canaan gets the, gets the, uh, the, the curse. That's, that's, that's a conjecture. Understand, all these conjectures are strictly conjectures. I mention just for your own breadth of, of uh, awareness, not that anyone is really provable. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. And uh, he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So see, God, I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Noah, there's another aspect of this too I should emphasize. We see this as a curse. In our language, it would seem that Noah is responding to that impropriety to curse them as he's initiating a curse. That's a possibility, but it could also be something else. It could be simply a prophecy that God through Noah is prophesying what's going to happen. You follow me? It isn't necessarily linked uh, directly. In any case, uh, and again, of course, Canaan is prominent in the text anyway because they become idiomatic of Israel's enemies when they enter the land, which is you know, obviously generations later. So cursed be Canaan, servant of service shall he be. Uh, he shall serve Shem, and we'll show you some examples of that. And God shall enlarge Japheth. Now, the word Japheth means enlargement. There's a pun going on here. And uh, Japheth, of course, is the son that populates most of the world. They're the ones that really spread out. Most of, the year, most of uh, uh, going north and going uh, west and east is sons of Japheth. Ham went south. Shem stays roughly in the same region in various forms. So we'll see all that later. Now, the Canaanites... Um, were defeated and enslaved by the eastern kings in Genesis 14. We'll study that when we get there for lots of good reasons. The Gibeonites under Joshua became woodchoppers and water carriers for Israel's tabernacle in Joshua 9. The Battle of Carthage, getting into more, uh, you know, in, 19, in 146 uh, B.C. The Phoenicians, that were really Canaanites in effect, were finally defeated, of course, by Rome in the Battle of Carthage, a big thing. If you saw the movie The Gladiator, you remember that's where that's reenacted in a, in, in a, in a form. So anyway, this finishes it up, and Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So he's a pretty old guy, because it was the flood. You know, it was what 600 year of his life, and now he's 350 years later. And all the days of Noah were 950 years. Boy, and he died. 
And uh, so we get to chapter 10. Now, chapter 10 is one of these pivotal chapters. You don't need to memorize it, but you may want to take some notes as you study your Bible, not tonight, but in general, so you understand these strange names you're going to see. Um, and I'll give you some background on that. Uh, by the way, does anybody know the name of Noah's wife? Huh? There you go, Joan of Arc. Everybody knows Joan of Arc. There you go. I had to give him a chance at that, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, we're going to take them in inverse order. Shem's the most important. We'll take him last. The one that comes first is Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. And what we're going to find out is each, we're going to go through 70 names. A few of them we'll highlight because they're important to you. But it's interesting, I'll show you when we get to the end, why 70 it turns out to be an interesting number. But we'll take the sons of Japheth first, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and uh, Tubal and Meshech and Tiras. And then from those seven, you get a few more. You get the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Tagarma. And then the sons of Yavan, uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Kitten, and Dananim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, and in, in their nations. I want you to notice something that's going to be important next chapter. These isles or areas or regions of Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue. The division that's in view here is not continental drift. When we get to, we're going to get to a place where it talks about in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. And many people assume that somehow has to do with continental drift. I think if that happened, that happened during the flood. What's, what it's talking about is the division of the languages, which occur in chapter, the main event in chapter 11. And this is one of the hints right here to help you get that in perspective. But let's try to lay this out. Japheth had Gomer and Herodotus, Herodotus who is considered the father of all history, and Plutarch, and so we talk a lot about the, the uh, Sumerians, which uh, settled along the, Dab the Danube and the Rhine. Uh, so there, uh, Ashkenaz is a son of his that uh, speaks really uh, much of Germany. Riphath, Josephus links that to the Paphlagonians. The word Europe actually derives from the Riphath language, but Tagarma, of course, refers to the Armenians and as well as Turkey and Turkestan. So these are Japheth, uh, Gomer, and then his sons, and then Magog. Now, let me stop here for a minute. Have you ever wondered why, all through the Bible, it uses these weird names? Do you know why it does that? We make it do that. It's our fault. You see, you and I, we keep changing the names of things. There was a city called Petrograd, and then it became St. Petersburg. Then for quite a few years it was Leningrad. Now today it's St. Petersburg again. What will it be next year? Who knows? You know? The, the, there was a town called Byzantium that became the capital of the whole world when, when the capital moved from Rome to, to, to there and renamed it Constantinople. When the Muslims overran it, they changed it to Istanbul. There was a, uh, there's a place in the United States called Cape Canaveral. How many remember Canaveral? Now it's called Cape Kennedy. And it came that close to being called Cape Hillary. And let's, let's watch that. <laughs> See, we keep changing the names of things. But, and so if you're Isaiah and God calls upon you, you know, Isaiah talked a lot about the fall of Babylon which is really weird if you realize that in Isaiah's day it hadn't even risen to an empire yet, you see. But even more interestingly, Isaiah talks about the Persian Empire coming. Now how does Isaiah talk about the Persians over a hundred years before it shows up in history? He talks about it as Elam, who's the forebear of the Persians. You see, we don't change the name of our ancestors. So if you're trying to talk about the descendants of Abraham, you can do that because Retroflect, they don't change the name after he's dead. You with me? It may change the name while he's alive, but not if he's, in other words, your ancestors are, are, are those labels. So we get to this Magog label, which is very important when you get to Ezekiel to figure out who are Magog. And fortunately, there are a couple of writers. Hesiod, who is a Greek didactic poet in the 8th century, wrote a great deal about the descendants of Magog. He called them by their Greek name, the Scythians. Herodotus, who is called by scholars as the father of all history, he wrote in the 5th century B.C., these guys are prior to and roughly contemporary, con contemporaries with Ezekiel in the first place. And so their writings are very valuable to us for vocabulary, if nothing else. So the Scythians are the, the, uh, the descendants of Magog, and the Scythians in turn are the descendants of a number of tribes, not the least of which are the true Russians. The Scythian Empire, or I shouldn't say empire, the Scythian dominance 
was on the southern steppes of Russia from the Ukraine all the way to China from the 10th century BC through the 3rd century BC. They, they were a nomadic group on horseback. So you couldn't conquer them, they just retreat. And they developed a thing called defense in depth. And that tradition saved Russia against Napoleon, and that tradition saved Russia against Hitler. The whole idea of def just retreating and letting the ex ex extended, overextended logistics kill off your enemies. And uh, that's what they, d they developed that to a fine art. And, and that's why Herodotus' writings are so important to the Greeks, because they, they tried to master all that. Interesting, interesting uh, people. Um, but also, under Japheth, we have Medai, who, who is the father of the Medes, and you and I know them as the Kurds. It's interesting how this, this ancient group of people who have no country, there's about 25%, give or take, in several different countries, some part of Turkey, northern part of Iraq, some of Iran, and uh, they're, they're a, considered a uh, thorn in the flesh by all the countries they reside in, and yet they're people without a country, the Kurds. They emerged about the 10th century BC. They made a coalition with Persia to make the Persian Empire in the 7th century BC. The, 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 the Medes and the, the, Medes and the uh, Elam, Elamites, the Persians, uh, formed what, uh, Cyrus. His mother was a Mede, his father was a Persian. And uh, so he was half of both. And he brought them together to create the, the incredible Persian Empire that dominated the world for 200 years. Then there's a couple called Tubal and Meshech. They're both identified with major cities in eastern Anatolia, which we know today as Turkey. The eastern two-thirds of Turkey was Anatolia. And, uh, Yav and, and by the way, Magog, Tubal, and Meshuk are the prominent ones in this invasion of Israel that's yet to take place that may be on the horizon. Yavan, or Ionia, of course, is Greece and a number of other groups. And Tiraz are the Pelasgians of the uh, Aegean, the Etruscans of Italy, and others. So. Gomer, as I said, had three sons, Ashkenaz, Rephath, and Tugarma. Tugar the Armenians today call themselves the House of Tugarma. But that can be misleading because there's a couple other tribes that also regard themselves as descendants of Tugarma. And that also comes up in prophecy a lot. These, that's why these identities are kind of important to us. And Yavin has a number of these that I won't try to get into all of them, but Tarshish is worth mentioning because there's not conclusive evidence, but there's some suggestive evidence that Tarshish was probably in the British Isles. Most Bible handbook stuff figure it was Cyprus or maybe Spain. They don't, they don't have the imagination. They know it is a very distant island that's a source of tin. That's what we know from the scripture. Well, the Britain is, a, is the source of, Britain is the source of tin. And also, we know from excavations at Stonehenge that they carried on worldwide trade in the Bronze Age period. So the, it's, it's very possible that Jonah, when he was trying to run a, get as far away from Nineveh as he could think of, took a ship to Tarshish, because that was considered as far away as he could think of. Analogous to our figure of speech taking a slow boat to China. See, he took a slow boat to Tarshish was the concept. So Tarshish may be the British Isles, and that has implications. Anyway, so with Japheth we've looked at. Gomer, Magog, Medai, Yavin, Tubal, Meshech, and Teraz. Those, those are seven, but there were seven sons under those for a total of 14. We'll come back to that later. Then we get to Ham. Uh, the Hamites went south, and, and uh, 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 sons of Ham... Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Sheba, Havilah, uh, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteka. And the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Many people portray him as a hunter. His symbol also, by the way, was a bow, because he was a hunter, presumably. Except most scholars recognize that what it really means here, he was a mighty one, not as just a mighty hunter. He hunted men. He was the first world dictator. We'll talk more about him. In fact, right here in the middle of this genealogy, we have a little insert. So we have Cush, Mithraim, Put, and Canaan. Now, Cush settled east of, uh, um, correction, Cush settled south of the second cataract of the Nile. Mithraim is a dual. We have singles and furs. It's a dual for upper and lower Egypt. And uh, so Mithraim is the biblical term for Egypt. Put settled uh, west of Libya. Think of Put as the North Africans, the Berbers, and so forth. And they're different. They're different genealogically than ones uh, south of, of, of. So think of Cush's south and Put to the to the west in Africa, and Canaan, of course, the Canaanites. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, we could talk more about that, but that's that's pretty. Let's keep going here. 
Speaking of Nimrod, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So he earned a title. He was feared. And at the beginning of his kingdom, aha, he's a kingdom, was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, and the land of Shinar, or Shinar. Shinar is probably more correct. And uh, so he is the founder of these cities. And uh, Babel, of course, becomes ultimately Babylon. And it's good. we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next session because Babylon, you can look at the Bible as a tale of two cities. Jerusalem as God's city and Babylon as man's city or Satan's city. And uh, they're going to be in juxtaposition throughout the Bible. They're going to be in juxtaposition introduced here and they will be in juxtaposition in the book of Revelation. And we'll talk about that next time in the next session. So the word Nimrod means rebel. Rebelling against God. He's the first world dictator. I like to call the coming world leader that typically is called the Antichrist, I like to call him as Nimrod the second. Not reincarnated, not necessarily genetically related, but in, in terms of the role that he's going to play. The first world dictator was a Nimrod, the last world dictator will turn out to be a Nimrod. He was the founder among of these cities, including Babylon and Nineveh, which of course are prominent cities in ancient history. And we'll detail some of this in the next session. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kala and Razan between Nineveh and Kala. The same is a great city. So we see the rise then of these cities and that's going to give rise to the events of chapter 11. And Mitzrayim, again Ludim and Ananim and uh, Lahabin, and these are all plurals by the way, Neftubim. Uh, Mitzrayim is, uh, as I say, is, is uh, basically the term for Egypt and Babrusim, and Kazluhim, and there's some others I can't pronounce properly, out of whom Philistine, out of whom Philistine. Now, by the way, the Philistines came originally from Egypt. They went from there to Cyprus, and then from Cyprus to the land that we think of, the land of the Philistines. Many Bible handbooks point out that the Philistines came from Cyprus, but they don't reach back far enough because they got to Cyprus from, e from Egypt. That's important to understand. And I'm all, I often point out that Yasser Arafat is not a Palestinian, he's an Egyptian. But he could technically lay claim because if he's Egyptian, he could be a Philistine and, and trace his li line back, if you will. Um, the word Philistine, when the Romans got fed up trying to administer Judea in, uh, in, in uh, 130, one, one, roughly 140 uh, A.D., uh, the, 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 the Romans were uh, uh, frustrated by Bar Kokhba, who led a revolt. And Bar Kokhba's gang slaughtered the Roman 12th Legion, among other things. That's uh, something they never recovered from. It took them three years to get their act together before they crushed the Bar Kokhba revolt. But by then, Emperor Hadrian had a belly full of trying to run this region because of all the tensions. So they came to the conclusion they could never rule Jerusalem as long as there was any Jewish presence in Jerusalem. So they leveled the city, not just the temple, that happened earlier. They leveled the city, they plowed it under, and built a Roman city on top of it called Aila Capitolina. And they, uh, uh, they made a death penalty of any Jew caught in, in, in Jerusalem. And they named the whole region uh, f after the Philistines, Israel's enemies, as an attempt to deny any Jewish presence there. The word Philistine in Latin was Palestina. And the word Palestine is a corruption of the Latin for Philistine. It's a name that's designed to deny Israel's place in the land. So whenever you use the term Palestine, you're using the label of Israel's enemies. You need to understand that. And uh, it all has its roots here in Genesis 10. And Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn. That leads to the, all the Phoenicians and so forth, the, the, the legendary people in seagoing uh, exploits. Begot, uh, begot, uh, Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Aravite, Aravadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterward there were families of the Canaanites spread abroad. Boy, were they spread abroad. Do you know where the Sinites went? Make a guess. S-I-N-O, what does that prefix imply? China, you betcha. 
the Chinese are derivative of, the Can of Canaan, interestingly enough. And uh, these, many of these tribal names will sound familiar to you because they emerge in the land of Canaan as the adversaries of Israel and Joshua and all of that in the book of Joshua and the book of Judges that follows. And uh, Sidon, of course, is to the north on the coast, becomes the Phoenicians and what have you, and so you can go through with these. Am the capital of the Amorites, of course, was Jericho and so on. And uh, those tribals are, th those are very important. Um, and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza. See the whole coast, from Sidon down to Gaza, as thou goest, unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and to Adma and Zeboim, even to Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. So if you take the Phoenicians and south, include uh, Africa, you've included the Hamites, pretty much. Don't confuse them with Shem, because we're going to get to him next. Ham, Misraim, Upper and Lower Egypt. It's a duel, by the way. And uh, Memphis and Thebes were the two capitals of the two parts. And, you know, it's interesting. You've probably seen movies and things where the Egyptians are wearing a headdress that has sort of a white cone thing and then a red crown sort of with it. The red crown was, uh, I forget which one's which, I think it was, was uh, uh, Lower Egypt and the white was Upper Egypt and they put them together when they merged. See, when you see that crown, that implies Upper and Lower Egypt, the United Egypt. Each crown was, strangely, was, was, was the identities of the two until they got together. And uh, so, and by the way, if the Philistines are Palestinians, then they're not the sons of Ishmael. Now, one of the things I haven't bored you with through this discussion here is what is an Arab? Because you'll discover if you try to attack that problem, no matter what premise you use, you'll end up in confusion. If you mean geography, you mean those that res reside in Arabia, then obviously you exclude Syria, Iraq, uh, uh, Iran, and lots of other places. If you say, no, I mean ethno ethnologically uh, uh, descendant of Ishmael, you've got a real big problem. Because none of the Palestinians are provably. In fact, nobody can trace their lineage back to Ishmael because they didn't keep distinct records. They intermarried the tribes. And so, um, and furthermore, they're not descendants of Ishmael in the first place because you, if you look at the 12 sons, uh, well, let's back up. They were, they were sons, the Bedouins are sons of Keturah. And, and, and other studies, we'll, we'll get into some of this and we'll do you a chart. When you see the, uh, the, uh, the uh, family trees, uh, you realize that much of the myths about the Arabs is, leads, to, leads to confusion. What adds to the confusion for all of these, I should mention this right now, is that the ethnic links get muddied up with the geography. For an example, if I say to you I'm a Californian, that implies I live in California. It doesn't necessarily mean I descended from Californian stock. Are you with me? And when we talk about tribal areas, a tribe that lives in a certain area gives their name to that region. Other people who in that region then get called by that regional name. Ephraim was a region for the tribe of Ephraim. But many people that came from that region were not necessarily Ephraimites in the sense of being descendants of that tribe. They, were, they happened to live in that geography. And that's where a lot of people get confused, especially when you start getting into the ten lost tribes and all that business. So understand, there's a lot of confusion uh, between the geography and the ethnic links. So uh, let's move on. Cush, of course, is Ethiopia, the Kassites, and uh, some even east of uh, Syria. Most of them settled south of the second cataract of the Nile. They thus become, they become idiomatic, if you will, of black Africa. Um, Nimrod, of course, was of, of Cush, and uh, he did Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Kalna. Put settled west of Egypt. And uh, uh, so um, uh, Libya, Athe uh, parts of Ethiopia, and North Africa. Canaan, Sidon to Gaza, and Sodom and Gomorrah, and so forth. And uh, Kittag uh, links to Cathay, the Sinites, of course, to China and so on. So that's Cush with his four key people. Let's go to Shem. We're building up to the... Shem is they're leaving the best to last in sense because Shem is the one we're most concerned with from a biblical perspective. Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the father of Japheth the elder, excuse me, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, Asher, and Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram, and then he goes to that and starts breaking them down. The children of Aram was Uz, Hul, and Gather, and Mash. And uh, Arphaxad begat Salah, and Salah begot Eber. We'll come back to him in a minute. And, and to, unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. 
For in his, that means division, the word means division, by the way. And pe, for in his days was the earth divided. And some people think that means continental drift. I don't think so. I think it's an anticipatory remark from, that will be amplified in chapter 11. And his brother's name was Yachtan. And Yachtan begot Almadad and uh, Skelef and Hazar Maraveth and, uh, and Yara. And Hadaram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and uh, Abimal and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All these were the sons of Yachtan. Now, the main use of some of these is if you're playing Bible trivia. But other than that, I'm not sure how useful some of those are. We'll move on. Shem, Elam, we've talked. He, that represents Persia or Elam, if you will, or Iran, if you will. Asher, Arphaxad. That's the important one for you and I for reasons you'll see shortly. He had Salah. Salah had Eber. And under e Eber had a guy by the name of Peleg in which the earth was divided. But I believe that means the language is the issue in, in chapter 11. And he had a brother by the name of Yachtan. And then Lud and Aram are mentioned, Aram being the father of the Aramaics and so forth. But in Genesis 11, we're going to pick up on this and add children of Peleg, which will include Ru, Sereg, Nahor, Terah, and Abraham. And that's the thing we're leading up to. All this is background for the rest of Genesis, the, 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 uh, from chapter 12 through 50, is a rundown of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and... Uh, Joseph. And so it's all, this is all a, a preamble, if you will. So that's why this particular chain is the critical one. And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest from Sephar to the Mount of the East. And they are, these are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, and their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after the generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Now notice here again, we're talking divisions, but by language and by genealogy. That will blur, of course, as life goes on. But there they are. That's the bunch. And what's interesting about these is that, uh, oh, by the way, if you really want to study this, there's some strange divisions among these where the word bene, meaning the sons of, is used 12 times in certain verses. Yalad, meaning he begot. And some people say this is rhetorical style. Others try to make a case here indicating that perhaps there are some missing links and so forth, not material to us. Canaan's descendants are emphasized because they are the traditional adversaries of Israel. So it's understand why those particular ones are underscored, if you will. Interestingly, the boundaries of the promised land, if you didn't notice, were in verse 19. So you can study that, if you will. And uh, something else, it's interesting that Shem, if you look at ones that are listed there, there are 26 under Shem, there's 30 under Ham. There's 14 under Japheth, the original seven plus another seven descendants of those. The total that's listed here in the so-called table of nations of Genesis 10 are 70. And I think that's not accidental. There were 70 nations that descended from Noah under Ham, Shem, and Japheth. There were 70 families that went under Jacob and Joseph into Egypt. They entered G Egypt in Genesis 46.10. Their boundaries are established according to Deuteronomy 32, verse 7 and 8. The boundaries not just of the families, but of the nations of the world. It's very interesting from the scripture, you can make a case that there are 70 Gentile nations and there are 70 members of the family of Israel, made up Israel. They're both in 70 elements and both of them, their boundaries are determined not by their foreign policies, not by their weapons technologies, not by their financial acumen, by the ruler of the universe. God sets those. That's interesting. That's interesting. Now, in Genesis 26, they, they speak of 66 of these. In Genesis 46, they speak of 70. In Acts, you'll hear Stephen speak of 75. Some people get all hung up. Gee, the Bible contradicts itself. No, because there are Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's two sons that Jacob adopts are not included in the 66. That gives you the 70. And, of course, Joseph's grandsons in the Septuagint are listed, the five of those, that straighten that mess out. So you've got the 70 that are, make up the nation Israel. You've got 70 that make up the table of nations. And both of, these, both of these have their bounds set by God in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. A little review from Deuteronomy. I thought you'd be interested. I thought we'd just keep moving here. The tower, next session will be about the Tower of Babel. Very, very important session. We'll discover that all the earth had one language at that time. Most scholars presume that it was Hebrew. Maybe it was a, a, a forebear of Hebrew. There was a godless confederacy organized by the first world dictator, Nimrod, which means we will rebel. 
He organizes capital on the plain of Shinar, creates a tower to heaven, Bab being tower, El being God, a tower to God. It wasn't, the, it wasn't as naive they're going to climb a ladder and get to heaven. That's not the point. Some people figure, well, it was also high, so in case there's a flood, they'd be able to survive. No, that's all naive. It's a, it's a, it's a religious thing. It's an astrological temple, and it's there that the zodiac gets corrupted. We'll talk briefly about that. You can look at the entire Bible as a struggle between two cities, at least idiomatically. Babylon, the city of man, or the city of Satan, and Jerusalem, the city of God. So you really want to pay attention to the origin of Babylon, what it signifies, and how it's used throughout the scripture, and we'll have some huge surprises for you in the next session. That was the Tower of Babel. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've laid out your plans from the beginning. We thank you, Father, that your plans include your plan of redemption, that you've gone to such extremes just so that we could live through the office and commitment and sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you'd help us understand these things, that you'd draw us ever closer to you and ever more aware of what you would have of us in these days as we commit our way into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.